Good evening. Good evening. This is Captain Fred Passman. I'm the uh, commander of the Naval Order of the United States Continental Commandery, and welcome you all to this evening's Naval History Virtual Lecture. Um, most of you obviously are members. For those who aren't, I'll just mention that uh, Naval Order's mission is to preserve, promote, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage. Uh, we're unique in that we are the oldest American hereditary so exclusive Naval Society, and um, we are always looking for new companions who are interested in Naval history. And by Naval, I mean Sea Services, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, NOAA, and of course, United States Navy. This evening, we have a special treat in that our lecturer is still on active duty. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Garrett Richards is um, currently serving as a training officer aboard the USS Detroit and LCS, home ported in Jacksonville, Florida. A native of Hershey, Pennsylvania, Garrett graduated from Vanderbilt University in 2017 with a degree in history and Latin American studies. Um, he was a uh, NROTC uh, participant under a four-year scholarship program, received his commission in the United States Navy upon graduation. Um, before reporting to the Detroit, he served as the gunnery officer aboard the USS Benfold, a guided missile destroyer that was four deployed in Yokosuka. What a tough place to serve. Um, he's currently in the process of transferring to the Naval Reserve and uh, hopes to uh, become a public affairs officer. He's also about to launch his graduate studies in international affairs. Garrett, welcome aboard. And we look forward to hearing uh, you discuss this evening something that has been on the minds of many of us who are convinced that we would have never made Lieutenant Junior Grade in today's <laughs> meeting, um, where our job was to get done what was needed and no questions were ever asked. So without, uh, what, what gave you the interest in sailors who as young officers received second chances? Well, what inspired you to focus on that? Well, I, um, well, thank you, Fred. Uh, and thank you to all of you listening. Um, honored to be here representing, um, the Navy here in the Naval order, um, presentation, uh, I was flattered when asked to do this. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, with, in regards to the topic, um, obviously you mentioned uh, my first tour of duty was in Yokosuka, Japan. I got there about a month before the Fitzgerald collided. And then three months later, the McCain collided. So I joined the Navy at a very fraught time in a very fraught place. And Upon hearing the news about, you know, what happened to the commanding officers, what happened to the individuals involved, it, I was, you know, curious about how decisions were made in regards to personnel when these incidents happened. And I, you know, read historical accounts about how it used to be different. So I'm excited to talk about that tonight. Excellent. So we're looking forward to hearing how it used to be different. So I'm going to give you the deck and the con and look forward to hearing uh, your presentation about some of our naval heroes, titans, who might not have made full lieutenant um, had they not been given a second chance. And I think everybody you're talking about uh, received as many stars as a flag officer could get. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you, Fred. And uh, thanks for everyone for listening. Um, so my presentation today is called Second Chances at Sea. Um, we'll be touching on some of what um, Fred discussed about our former leaders, our revered his, uh, figures in naval history, and about how they, they went on to greatness. Uh, but really, my focus of my presentation is on how the, I, the concept of redemption and the concept of accountability have shifted throughout the age and what that means for the Navy, what it means for sailors 
and really our, our military as a whole. So um, again, I'm honored to present um, obligatory statement. I am still in the Navy, uh, so I am not acting in an official capacity with this presentation. So don't be ratting on me if I diss the Navy here a little bit. Um, but and I'm really just here to start a conversation um, with um, your the members of this organization because I think it's an important topic. So um, if you have any questions, any comments, like to chat in, I uh, have the the chat function open. So feel free to chat over if I say something incorrect. If you want to challenge something I'm saying, or we just want to talk, um, please feel free. So we'll proceed. Jake. You reminded me of something, Garrett. So uh, for those of you watching on live stream, um, you, the comments area is live. And once Garrett has completed his formal presentation, I will um, pose your questions to him. Sounds great. Yeah, do we get? please do. Um, all right. Um... So again, I kind of already touched on the presentation's theme, uh, but it's about the evolving role of redemption, right? Um, I know this is typically included at the end, but I didn't want to forget to mention some of the sources I use because if you're interested in learning more about this topic, um, there's some really good things that you should read. One is the Crimes of Command book by Michael Junge, who's a former commander in the Navy. Excellent book uh, who I used a lot in producing this presentation, which outlines outlines the you know history of redemption and accountability up through the mid 20th century till today. Excellent book, a lot of great sources in there as well. Um, the next is the fighting uh, report on the fighting culture, United States Navy surface fleet. If you're in any way interested and what's going on with today's Navy and the challenges it's facing, I recommend reading the Senate report. I know it's a Senate report, but it's short and it's extremely pointed. And as someone who's been in the Navy over the past few years, I read a lot of that and really related to a lot of what it said. So I recommend taking a look. Um, look at some other websites, but then the last one, I'm gonna wrap up the presentation, the, the history, the chronology portion of this presentation by talking a little bit about Fitzgerald. Um, it's uh, close to home for me. I know some people involved in that situation, um, but the best article I've ever read about it is Blame Over Justice by Megan Rose of ProPublica, specifically talking about Commander Benson, who was the CEO of Fitzgerald and kind of the ordeal that he went through post collision. Uh, so highly recommend reading that ProPublica article if you have it. So I'll look. Um, sorry, my notes down here if I'm looking down occasionally. Um, Naval command is a sacred thing. I think everyone in this organization probably understands that. Um, military command is a sacred thing in general. It involves responsibility over people's lives, essentially, and enacting national policy. Um, but Naval command, at least in the history of the United States, is given a special kind of reverence. Um, and, and that largely dates back to the days of sail, um, where because of the lack of communication, commanding officers were sent out to handle a mission, and then that was it. That Everything else that happened between the ship leaving the pier and returning to home port was all on the CO. There was no phone calls, no video chats to the admiral, it was get the job done, here are your national priorities, and then go take action. Um, that culture is revered in the Navy and kind of, we can see vestiges of that to this day. Um, back in, in the days of sale, you know, not even the days of sale, but in history, you know, CEOs were even in charge of enacting foreign policy themselves. And one knows the story of Commodore Perry and his trips to, to Japan to establish foreign policy. Commanding officers were diplomats, they were the naval officers, and they had the ultimate responsibility. Um, in the 1999, in, excuse me, the 1990 version of the Navy regulations, the Navy says the responsibility of the commanding officer for his or her command is absolute. And that sentence underpins 
how the entire organization views command. I'm going to start with talking about a few naval, as Fred alluded to, a few naval leaders who had issues with being the CEO, had you know challenges while in command, specifically challenges with ship driving and collisions and elisions and the such. And then I'm going to pivot more into talking about more modern examples of this topic of accountability. So the first individual that I like to, to bring up is Alfred Thayer Mahan, um, who, as I'm sure you know, wrote the, the book Influence of Sea Power Upon History. He's a revered Navy figure, someone who um, helped establish our, our Navy doctrine and you know, how we view ourselves as an organization fighting for America's foreign policy objectives. But this individual struggled with the basic aspects of seamanship. Um, he was a notedly poor ship driver. He once hit a ship at anchor. He struck, he ran a ship into the side of a dry dock, hit a sailboat in broad daylight. He had multiple instances. He had command three or four times and had instances in almost in every one of his commands. And uh, he wrote, I, I like the story. He once wrote a letter to his wife saying, you'll never... You'll never know how hard it is to steer these ships straight. It was, it, was, it was a big challenge for him. Obviously, maybe not someone that you'd want leading a group of ships into battle, but he had a, he had a value to the Navy. He had a, maybe that value wasn't driving a ship, but he brought value to the organization. Obviously, his value was in the classroom, teaching students and writing doctrine. And that's why I wanted to start with Alfred Thayer Mahan. Is because, as we'll see later on, this you know, the, the idea of a valuable officer tends to narrow. Um, one of the most famous examples of a naval officer who rose to greatness from considerable challenge was Chester A. Nimitz, who I'm sure you're aware. Um, he commanded a small ship while he was an ensign, which was the, the USS Decatur, shortly after he graduated from the Naval Academy. Um, long story short, he didn't really know where the ship was at and didn't check the tides. And he ended up running the ship aground in the year 1908. Um, he was punished, understandably. He's court-martialed and found guilty of negl uh, negligence, but he had a good record and he was kept in service. Throughout history, um, punishing commanding officers, punishing officers for issues at sea is standard and to be expected. But what we'll see in the evolution is that the idea of second chances, of redemption, of finding another way for that officer to provide value in the Navy starts to morph and starts to change. Um, obviously, Alfred Thayer Mahan was given a chance to demonstrate his worth to the organization, and Chester A. Nimitz went on to greatness. Um, but as you'll see, this started to change after the Second World War. So um, Michael Jones, whose book I, re I referenced, defines kind of the post-World War II era as the era of redefining accountability and responsibility. I'm sorry, I just got a... Um... A comment here. The, the, the comments will all will cover them afterwards. Just ignore them. You want to cover them afterward? Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, post World War II, defining, uh, redefining accountability. So um, I'll start here with the first section of that, uh, the first example, which is the US Indianapolis. So um, a lot of you are familiar with the USS Indianapolis situation. Um, in 1945, right at the end of World War II, the, um, the USS Indianapolis was sent on a secret miss mission to Tinian, the island near Guam, where it was to deliver supplies for a nuclear weapon. The, um, the ship made it to Tinian, but however, it did not make it home, as I'm sure you're aware from the movie, the Nicolas Cage movie, and various other historical accounts, um, the ship was attacked by a Japanese torpedo, sunk, 
um, and only a few sailors survived, many of whom survived the initial attack, ended up being eaten by sharks. One of the individuals who survived was the captain, Captain McVeigh. And McVeigh, um, if you're not aware, was a very a revered naval officer, was known to be very kind toward his men, an effective commander in battle, and obviously a World War II veteran. And um, hit by the surprise attack on a secret mission when the ship was barely protected. He survives um, and was cited for the failure to engage in zigzag maneuvers. Um, if you're familiar with basic anti-submarine warfare, moving the ship around to avoid being hit by a torpedo. Um, the Board of Inquiry, a court of inquiry, was convened and found him guilty of that. However, Pat Paycom at the time, who is Admiral Nimitz, who we discussed earlier, disagreed with that assessment and trusted McVeigh, trusted that he did the right thing for his ship at the time and that he was a man of character and someone who had experienced fighting the war. This point is important because even though the Navy went through the procedure, and we'll get into more of this in a bit, went through the procedure of punishing this individual, convened a court of inquiry, and, and later sent this individual to court martial, there was this trust amongst his leaders, McVeigh's leaders, this being Chester Nimitz, that this individual did the right thing. There's an initial trust. You know, in America, you know, we're guilty until proven innocent. And a point, you know, in my opinion, we've moved beyond that, at least in, in terms of command at sea. As you can see later on through some of these examples, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate that, that, you know, that the guilty until proven innocent isn't something that, ex that a lot of these individuals are going to be afforded. But he was given the benefit of the doubt by his leadership. The Secretary of the Navy, Forrest Stahl, still wanted to take him to court martial. Um, he was taken to court martial. One of the witnesses to the court martial was actually the Japanese commander who, of the submarine who shot the USS Indianapolis. And he, among other people, ma made the claim that the zigzag wouldn't have been, done any good. He was convicted um, and then later committed suicide. However, his record um, has been dug up lately, um, especially after the Clinton administration. And many have found that his actions wouldn't have done anything it, to prevent the issue. That basically the zigzag maneuver would have been a moot point at this situation. Um, so that, you know, point being there, there's still a level of trust in this commanding officer even though the, the facts were essentially stacked against him. All right. So the next situation I have happened four months, uh, four months apart from the U.S. Indianapolis was the situation of the USS Queenfish, who was um, a submarine operating in the same op area. And um, most of my examples here are surface ships, but I think this has value as well. Um, basically, long story short, submarine um, goes out into the 7th Fleet Op area and shoots down the Awamaru, which is a Japanese civilian ship. Um, Captain reports this situation right away when he figures out that, hey, I shot a civilian ship that was not my intended target. Um, basically... Um, he was punished. He was, there was a court of inquiry, and he was given a letter of reprimand instead of being taken to court martial. Um, the admiral in charge of the situation, recognizing that there was a fault, there was an error in the situation, the admiral had his back, and um, this individual, the Captain Laughlin, eventually commanded a ship and became an admiral. Because of the facts, the facts were that it was he. Um, it was on. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to organize my thoughts. Um, the facts were were basic in that it was unrestricted. Um, I'm sorry, losing my train of thought here. Um, 
this was the time of unrestricted submarine warfare and um, the CO had responsibility to shoot down any surface ship that you deemed to be a hostile. So even though civilians were killed, even though errors were made, there was a recognition that this was a, a wartime environment and that the CO should be given deference. And finally, my last example in this time period is the USS Brownson and the USS Charles H. Rowan. I think this situation probably best encapsulates the attitudes at the time toward commanding officers and the idea that while commanding officers should be held personally responsible for their personal actions, that there was a there needed to be a holistic evaluation of the commanding officers. So in 1950, in the Atlantic Ocean, the USS Brownson and the USS Charles H. Rahone collided with each other. The Brownson was found to be at fault. The OD of the Brownson was taken to court-martial, but both the commanding officer of the Brownson and the commanding officer of the Charles H. Rahone were acquitted of all charges, were not even charged because, one, the CEO of the Brownson, even though that ship was found to be culpable, was not on the bridge of the ship. And with the Charles H. Rahone, the ship was not deemed to be the one responsible for the collision. Therefore, both COs were, um, were you know, allowed to, to remain in command and continue their naval careers. Uh, Michael Junge, in his book, speaks about this case and, and later says that personal accountability for personal action was the standard at this time, and that this situation uh, encapsulates that principle. We're going to talk about the USS Fitzgerald in here in a bit, and you'll be able to see the parallels between this case. But the point here is, before the modern era of accountability, there was still there was still a desire to hold commanders in uh, accountable for their actions, right? This high standard of command we have in the Navy is important, and it was important at the time. If you were a commanding officer whose personal actions caused the ship to collide, you could be held accountable, and at the very least, you'd be taken to a court of inquiry. But even in 1950, if you weren't at the bridge and you were training your ship correctly, you wouldn't necessarily be held at account. Um, the CEO of the Brownson had night orders dictating that if anything were to come up, he was to be called immediately. This is standard in, in night orders for any captain, any ship I've been on, that is the standard. If you're unclear as the intentions of another ship, you feel like we're steaming into danger, call the captain immediately. The CEO of the Brownson had that in his, in his orders. He was asleep. And then he wasn't there present for the situation. Fast forward to today's to today with the USS Fitzgerald, same thing applied. Captain was in his stateroom hang, and asleep in the night order said, call me if something happens. Ship collides. He didn't get a call, but he still lit, held accountable for the safety of the ship. So we're going to discuss kind of how this has moved forward. But this is a pivotal moment uh, before the modern day era of accountability takes place. All right. So, sorry, I'm just getting my notes up here. Okay, great. So, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the modern era is, um, what was the fate of, I'm sorry, I know I should be waiting for comments, but I saw what is the fate of Brownson's OD? He was taken to court martial and he was, um, he was kicked out of the Navy, essentially. Wasn't, um, you know, wasn't charged with homicide or anything, but he um, his naval career ended. Um, so, yes, in some ways that is a departure from previous cases where maybe even the OD would be able to survive that situation, but the commanding officer was still given the opportunity to continue his career. Uh, the mo So moving on to the modern era, um, what I would say is that, you know, we're entering into an era where there's less independence, but more accountability. 
Um, with the age of communications and satellite communications, a CEO can be reached instantaneously to um, a CEO can be reached instantaneously by an admiral um, to task him with other tasks, to ask for the status of equipment, ask for the status of personnel. The days of sale when a commanding officer would be sent to a foreign country and told to um, come back when the mission is over, is done or over. Um, however, we're moving into a period where despite these limitations, despite the lack of responsibility the commanding officers are given, they're held to greater accountability. Um, one of the situations I want to touch briefly on is the coal. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, in 2000, the coal was bombed off of Yemen when it was in port in Aden, Yemen, uh, for a brief stop for fuel. The um, 12 sailors died, and eventually, um, the commanding officer was, um, there were investigative proceedings for the commanding officer, but the commanding officer was not uh, was not charged um, was not the commanding officer excuse, okay I'm sorry the commanding officer was char was I'm sorry <laughs> I don't know why I'm so flustered right now um, the um, yes so the, um, the commanding officer was later investigated was deemed to, was issued a letter of reprimand, but was not charged with any criminal proceedings and was allowed to retain his command. He ends up retaining his command and then was, um, he retains his command and he, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I am still. He retains his command um, and he was later set up for promotion for captain but the um, um, later, uh, due to congressional proceedings, his promotion to captain was withheld because at the end of the day, the Navy recommended, um, held up his promotion in administrative limbo for multiple years because of the situation happened with coal. Bottom line, situation happens, the Navy deems that the CO was given a level of reprimand, but he was not at fault for the situation. But later on, when up for promotion for captain, he was unable to promote because of the basically ambiguity hanging over his head um, that the ship, uh, that this was his fault, that he was involved in a collision. And why I bring this up is his eventual fate in not promoting to captain was largely because of a perception that because he was involved in a situation that where the ships collided, where the ship got hit by um, a group of terrorists, that he was not someone to be promoted. The facts dictated that um, he did everything right. The ship was known to have trained very well in damage control, very well in anti-terrorism operations. But at the end of the day, his promotion was withheld because of a fog around his career. Um, my next example uh, we'll be talking about is the USS Fitzgerald. Um, this, uh, this situation um, is important to me. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I showed up to Yokosuka, Japan a month after the Fitzgerald, uh, excuse me, a month before the Fitzgerald collided um, with a tanker ship off the coast of Japan. Bottom line, the, um, the ship left home port in Japan after a long and frantic day. The ship had been working for, had been working in doing workups training cycle for days prior. And the ship left home port that day. Um, and it went to sea, and later that night, the um, while the captain, Commander Benson, was asleep, the ship collided with a tanker ship and, um, and killed seven sailors. Um, again, I recommend reading the ProPublica article on this. and talks about Commander Benson's situation. Um, Commander Benson had recently taken command of the Fitzgerald months before the incident. He did not qualify the officer of the deck in question. 
and he he did not qualify the officer of the deck in question, and he went um, and he was in the midst of a rigorous training phase. Um, if anyone has any experience out in Seven Fleet before the collisions, um, it was a difficult place to train. Um, my ship, the USS Benfold, when we went to sea um, the, for the first time after being in a 10-month availability, there was no organized training phase. The scaffolding was taken off, the, and the ship was sent out to sea. And we conduct most of our training phase operations while on our initial deployment. And this is similar with Fitzgerald. They were running simulation training while conducting real-world operations. Again, Commander Benson did not qualify the OD in question. It, the ship was underway very early in the morning, pulls an extremely long day of work. And then at the middle of the night, the ship crashes, and um, he was found later hanging off the side of his cabin. What happens next is uh, represents the evolution that the Navy has taken in regards to accountability and command. Um, as many of you are aware, Commander Benson, after being found hanging off the side of his cabin, was flown off the ship and eventually ended up going to the Walter Reed Military Hospital. Um, spent months there recovering, suffered severe PTSD, and then um, later, not only was he relieved of command, but the Navy attempted to charge him with negligent homicide. Um, so not... Uh, so... What what is upsetting about this and what kind of changes the parameters of this is not only was this man's life, you know, literally ripped from under him and loses his command, but now has to face the, you know, the Navy in his darkest hour. This is an organization he devoted 20 years of his life to and now has to basically um, fight for himself in a court of law. Um, as many of you are aware, the case ended up being... Um, Cases against him ended up being dismissed due to conflict of interest with the admirals presiding over the case. Um, but the situation represents profoundly the change in accountability. As I'm um, sure you'll remember, with the, um, as I spoke about earlier, the case with the USS Bronson. The USS Bronson collided with another ship off the coast of Atlantic, two Navy ships instead of one ship, one Navy ship and a cargo vessel, as is here. And... The CO was was not only was he not charged with right negligent homicide, but he was allowed he was given the um excuse me, he was um allowed to continue his command in his naval career. Because why? He was not on the bridge at the time of the ship, and none of his direct actions resulted in the ship's colliding. As I'm sure you're aware. Oops, Sorry about that. My phone just went off. Um, the Fitzgerald CEO wasn't really there was there was no debate on whether he was involved. In, in the modern era of command, if you were involved in a situation where the ship collides with another ship and their lives lost, you're going to be let go. There's no rule book saying that, but that is likely what is going to happen um, as a result of that situation. Before I talk about, in my opinion, my layman's opinion on where, on what this means for the Navy, I'd like to speak a little bit on how we got here. Um, what I recommended earlier, the Senate, um, the Senate report on the on the the health of of the surface Navy, and one of the the most profound things that I read in there is um, in talking about the overall culture of the Navy was a fear of the media and public backlash. And basically the port report makes the argument that the Navy has become laser focused on its public, on its, on the public's opinion of the organization and of any news articles, any press about the institution. And that this, at the senior leadership, you know, reads things like the Navy times and is, and is looking to, to fight off any public affairs battle with a quick and immediate administrative action, 
often the easiest and quickest administrative action that can be taken for is um, firing the commanding officer, right? That's a very easy and public way to say, you know, we're taking care of this situation. Um, Michael Judge talks, talk, touches on this as well. And I, I think this is important because in, in the court of public opinion, the average American doesn't understand the complexities that go into a lot of these situations. They've never been on, an, on the bridge of a Navy ship and they don't understand what it means to, to drive the ship. They don't understand the, the hundreds of people that work there, the, the vast amount of equipment and just the fact that uh, accidents happen. And this laser focus on public affairs and, and what's going on in the media creates a situation for the Navy where if the goal is to stay out of the press and the goal is to prove to the press that the American people are taking care of the situation, the easiest way to do it is to fire someone. Uh, Michael Junge also speaks, in addition to that, speaks about years at, um, kind of where we have moved on as, um, as a country in our foreign policy. It's no secret that since World War II, our Navy hasn't really been involved in many large naval battles. Obviously, there's been minor skirmishes here and there, but the average Navy ship is not involved in surface, you know, fighting surface combatants. We're a, we're a power projection force. We're a force that, you know, shows, is a visible, visible rec uh, representation of America's diplomacy. And if we are engaged in conflict, it's often on the, over the horizon spectrum, right? It's, shooting a tomahawk into Libya or something like that. And that requires a completely different skill set. It doesn't, it's, nece it's not necessarily the most ship driving focus, right? So part of that leads, um, you know, part of that is that um, we don't have as much experience. We're not driving the ship as much. A lot of the ships aren't getting as underway as much. And it leads... In, in, in the words of, of Michael Jones, that, you know, it leads to some problems with it breeds more cautious leaders that lack a peer adversary to train against. Right. We're not fighting. You know, obviously, we're, we're talking more about peer to peer conflicts now. But in the age since World War Two, we really haven't had a lot of peer to peer engagements. Um, and we're not. And, and as such, we don't really have as many real world situations to train with, to train better ship drivers, and also to breed a larger risk tolerance within the, the organization. Another point that's made by Michael Judge that I um, find very fascinating is that the era of accountability, the shift in accountability toward a time of more compassion, acceptance toward believing in our people more happened since the days of Hyman Rickover. Um, Hyman Rickover, uh, commonly referred to as the father of the nuclear Navy, had a large impact upon the naval operation as a whole, not just the nuclear Navy, but in terms of the administrative processes within the Navy. He was known... Um, for being an intense technocrat and a very aggressive middle man, uh, a very aggressive manager, right? He um, he had a very much a zero defect mentality. Uh, fired commanding officers very willingly, and um, was well known for his micromanagement. Even to this day, nuclear trained officers have to go interview in person at the time with him. All officers under his command had to be interviewed with him. And this created this culture within the Navy, this coincide with, so, you know, there's two forces at play here. There's the idea that we're moving away from a wartime environment. And at the same time, we have this individual in charge who's in, in charge of a big portion of the Navy, which is moving the Navy toward administrative excellence, toward a pursuit of zero defect mentality. So we're losing that opportunity to demonstrate skills at sea and that risk tolerate tolerance associated with being at war 
And we're also moving into an era where in order to maintain more complex, more lethal ships, we have to pursue this zero defect mentality. I think it's pretty clear from my presentation that I find some of these developments troubling, but I think it's important to play the devil's advocate here and, and say, is this really a problem? And I, I would love for us to have a discussion about this as well. You know, CEOs are given an immense amount of opportunity of, of power, right? And just because we have moved into a different era where news is more readily available and we have a lower acceptance of you know, problems, deaths associated with our operations, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should take the pedal off the gas for the commanding officers. Many, I'm sure, in the organization would argue that that's just a consequence of where we're at and a consequence of the job. And if you can't tough it out, then so be it. Um, it's not exactly an opinion I would agree with, but it's worth noting. Um, from my perspective, the push towards aggressive accountability, towards punishing officers in more ways than one, to you know, to the situation of the you know, from the situation of the USS Cole, where even after he was found to not have been responsible, he was unable to promote there to the situation in, with Fitzgerald where he wasn't even given an opportunity to really plead his case. There's, I think there's real, there's really real harmful effects in this, this culture that this, or, that we as an organization have created. Um, I can speak from, from firsthand experience that our, you know, a lot of commanding officers understandably are, fearful for their jobs while in command. These individuals serve for 18, 19, 20 years, given a command of a ship. They're years away from a pension. Um, they've got young kids and they can see firsthand from their peers that any situation regarding the ship, colliding with another ship, grounding the ship, aligning with something on the pier, that... The, any situation like that will result in this in the captain being fired. And that creates a culture that permeates down to the lowest level, right? It creates a culture where there's more fear in an organization. And it also sends a really toxic message to our young leaders. Uh, I can speak to from personal experience that I know many individuals who in a different era and a different time would consider be pursuing a command. They enjoy driving the ship. They enjoy interacting with sailors. But at the end of the day, they see the risk reward and figure that they can't risk their own financial future, their family's life, and their personal sanity for this job if, that, if there's a good chance at the end of the day that if something happens, regardless of whether they were there, present there or not, that the Navy won't have their back. And I think that's the biggest thing. I, I, junior officers, commanding officers all understand that people need to be punished, right? This is an important job. It needs to be taken seriously. And if, it, if a situation arises where lives were lost at sea, there needs to be an investigation. But there's this assumption now that no matter what happens, the Navy will turn their back on individuals who, who are involved in these situations, regardless of their personal involvement. And that is the part that really scares junior officers and, and, and prevents them from wanting to continue on in the organization. If this is a problem, what can be done? I'll, um, I'll leave the solutions up to, to more um, knowledgeable and skilled people. Um, but in my opinion, um, a simple, you know, cultural shift with a more holistic approach would go a long way. Don't have to get rid of formal procedures of inquiry. Don't have to get rid of the option to take someone to court martial or remove them to the command, but just make it very clear to the commanding officers and to the junior officers that that you know situations happen and that when and if something happens while they're in command, that they'll be given the opportunity to um, to 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 plead their case and that the situation will be treated with holistically. 
I think a level of nuance and an understanding that playing to today's news cycle isn't going to get us any get us very far would go a long way. Uh, that's kind of wrapping it up. Um, I'm sorry uh, for my pauses there. Um, I'm going to look over a couple questions. What is your perspective on the number of of being relieved of command or for off duty behaviors or for doing any excellence for the crews? So I um, chose not to cover the um, situations involving off duty behaviors. Um, there's a more than enough information on situations where ships collided or, or having issues operating at sea. Um, Michael Junge's book, highly recommend touches a lot on that. Um, so I'd recommend reading his account more thoroughly. I would say that it has a similar impact though, and it represents a similar problem, right? My, you know, in the past, personal accountability for personal actions was the standard for off duty behaviors or demand, you know, from say a crew member, that's kind of straying away from that personal accountability for a personal action. Fred, did you have something? Thank you. Well, before I raise some of my questions, and I want to thank you for a, a, an interesting set of perspectives. Uh, I will confess, I was thinking more in terms of, of people who ran ships aground as junior officers and went on to become flag, you know, admirals of the fleet. Um, Admiral King is always the one, first one that comes to mind. That's a great and, example as well, yeah. You know, as a person who in today's Navy might not have had the chance for further promotion, not as a commanding officer, but as a junior officer learning how to drive a ship and screwing up. <laughs> um, you know, he, he had that second on the hands. He, his commanding officer had uh, faith that he was going to take advantage of the learning opportunity. Um, and I think along those lines, we have a, a question um given the current organization culture how are we now inspiring future leaders in the navy to have that nelson touch in battle and and you know we've often heard how uh nelson basically gave broad sailing directions to his skippers you know i expect you'll do your best to engage with the enemy at every opportunity well i think you know, I think operating in the Nelson style, engaging the enemy requires taking risks. And if we're encouraged, if we're sending the message to our naval leaders that any that there will be very little tolerance for any mishaps, I think it's safe to say we're not exactly encouraging risk taking and, and therefore not putting our, our, our leaders to be in a position to take risks in battle. But Again, it just touches on what are the goals of the organization. If our goals are operational excellence and having zero problems at sea, then that's what we're pursuing. But if our goal is to be that war fighting war, you know, war fighting, you know, organization that takes risks, we're not we're not really pursuing that at the moment. But that's it. That's a that's a product of where we're at foreign policy wise as well. Okay, so you know. <laughs> Can man see is, is one of those things to which all naval officers aspire. And it's that double edged sword, as you indicated. Um, you've got tremendous responsibility. Mm -hmm. You have unique level of authority in order to make sure that your ship is ready to fight and is always operationally uh, excellent. What about the responsibility of the commanding officer? And, and, you know, one of the interesting things, and there's many tales of, you know, uh, on Thursday, I assume command. Friday, I went out to sea. One of my JOs ran me aground, and that's the end of my career. And, and yeah. that, that goes way, way back. Um, uh, I don't know if you know the tale when uh, uh, Roosevelt was being uh, taken over to the Malta conference. Um, one of the skippers who had been aboard all of like three weeks. Um, there was a live torpedo exercise, second day out, third day out, they were doing a simulation, but one of the second class torpedo men forgot to pull the electric uh, plugs off of 
the torpedoes and the destroyer launched the fish. Um, I found that story particularly compelling because one of my friends uh, in my community was a retired chief petty officer from World War II. He had been uh, in the radio shack. He was a RMC. And um, all of a sudden, the Iowa um, kicked up to flank speed and <laughs> did a sharp port turn. And he runs out of the radio shack to see what's going on. He sees uh, President Roosevelt sitting there looking over the rail, casual as could be, with two special service agents having their, you know, their pistols drawn. He had no idea why they were drawn. And after about 15 minutes, everything returned to normal and there was never anything said. Uh, and then um, I guess it's about five, six years ago, the story came out, this poor commanding officer who um, thereafter got to spend the rest of the war driving a desk, uh, um, you know, had had no chance to train his crew. Um, he was doing his best to train his crew as they were making the transit. But as commanding officer, you you assume a certain level of responsibility. And then maybe that's something that by the time you make 05, 06, you should come to peace with. Um, I, I agree. I agree that, and I think that's, you know, that's inherent to the job, but there's a, there's just a, at least from the perspective of people that I work with, there's just a, a lack of, of nuance and holistic approach that just kind of scares people out of this where no matter what it is, it doesn't matter if it's completely out of their hands. It's just generally they're going to, they're going to get fired. And that, I think that part is a little dangerous. I give it, putting you know holding them to account is extremely important but it's just that that lack of nuance and that lack of a holistic review I think I think is damaging to the culture in my view. okay now if you take for example from the chief of naval operations on down you always have a boss true yeah and you I think you touched on it and you know, the our ability to communicate globally real time because we can, should we? I I think that's a legitimate concern, you know, for commanding officers is because when you do have that constant communication turned on 24 seven, there's very little opportunity to make real time decisions without constantly second guessing yourself and and taking those risks that might be in the in the in the Nelson touch, right? You know, a couple of months ago we uh, received a lecture about the uh, Battle of uh, Leyte Gulf, and um, you know, it's interesting. Even though the ships were almost within visual distance, communications pretty much were lost, and even to the extent that there was some confusion of which were our ships, which were the Japanese ships. And uh, each CO had to take it on their own to many cases, destroyers were going against cruisers, um, light cruisers, heavy cruisers, uh, and the COs knew that their job was to, if they were going to get sunk, take as many Japanese ships down with them as they could. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing from you is that's no longer the climate. Now, it, you don't want to move from point alpha to point bravo without getting formal consent from your immediate commander no at least from in my perspective there's just a there's a constant communication near constant communication i remember you know one time my ceo was fretting about our loss of internet connectivity because he needed to send an email you know to the convoy and that's i'm not you know, you know, and but but you know, it's just we're in the middle of the, in the in the South China Sea operating, and understandably, he needs to reach out to higher headquarters. But there's that, you know, it's a necessity that we need to communicate all the time, and that just that takes away from the CO kind of being the CO in a way. In so, mind. in terms of exercising and, and being able to handle, you know, a great question just popped up: What if communications are interrupted because of a cyber attack, or satellites are destroyed? Does our culture enable independent thought on behalf of commanding officers? And this, you know, this is theme uh, Admiral Sardis, uh, his fiction book. 
2034. Uh, I think goes right to the heart of that. I don't know if you've read that book yet. No, but, I have not. Um, it, it's all around uh, our uh, our adversaries basically taking out our, our comms through a, a major EMP blast. I think I have not read that book, but I have, you know, read numerous articles on that. And it's a, it's a realistic possibility. Also, I've been at, you know, minus any attack from an adversary. I've been at sea many times where the communications just don't function, whether or not that was an attack or not, you know, and they're not the most reliable at times. And, and I think John brings up a really good point is that if we demand constant communication and constant relay back to headquarters, where does that put people when, you know, that doesn't exist? You don't have the communications. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the last question we have time for um, on an unrelated topic, um, how does the USS Detroit's war room uh, feel about what's happening in uh, the Ukraine right now? How does that affect your day to day or your preparations for getting underway? Well, it does not affect my ship's current preparations because we're still figuring out the maintenance end of that. So right. I don't think we're going to Ukraine anytime soon. Um, but um, I think it alarms people. I haven't spoken a ton to my colleagues about it, but it's it's certainly alarming. Uh, I know individuals that are out on ships in that region. Um, but I, from my perspective... It's definitely something to be concerned of, but I'd be I'd be more concerned if I was over there in the. You know, there's we have a couple of ships based in Rhode Island. I'm sure that they're very out there right now dealing with that situation. Great, and then uh, I want to take one more chance to uh, thank you. You know, it's yeah. it's always great to hear a perspective of somebody at your end of the career spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us who are watching, uh, either our uh, members who have not served or who have um, like one of my recent reflections is all of today's ensigns graduate were born after I retired in, the <laughs> in 1998 and and I'm not in the upper 10 percent age category of naval order uh, naval order United States members and so a lot of us had a very different experience um, as I said at the outset, some of the things I did as a junior officer probably would not pass muster in the modern Navy, but I had a ship that was over 20 years old, and I was an engineering officer, and my job was to not miss commitments. And my, my captain uh, believed in a different version of don't ask, don't tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if we make commitments, we were good. All right. Thank you, Garrett. I yeah, know thank you, John, to tell us a little bit about what we can look forward to in the next couple of months. Don't go away, but I'm going to take you off the stream. Great. So let me just add my thanks to uh, Lieutenant Garrett Richards for an excellent presentation on a really important topic. Um, and thank you, Fred, for uh, hosting. Next month, March 24th, uh, at 1900 hours, we will have Peter Harrington, who is the uh, curator of the uh, Anne S.K. Brown Military Collection at Brown University as our um, lecturer. Uh, Peter will talk about military artists, primarily in World War II, with examples from the collection at Brown, and the focus will be on artists and subject matter involving sailors, Marines, Coast Guard, Guardsmen. So it should be a very interesting and a little different uh, topic for uh, our companions. Sounds fast. I'm looking forward to it next month. And uh, those of you who are watching, I will be posting uh, announcements on LinkedIn and you'll be receiving broadcast emails to remind you of the time and date and providing you with the link for the live stream. And with that, I wanna thank everyone who's joined us this evening. Uh, everybody have a great month and uh, look forward to seeing you virtually a month from now, March 24th, correct? Correct. Um, 24 March and same time, same channel. Everybody be well 
And uh, again, if you have not responded to my communications check, please, uh, there is no such thing as being too late. Send me an email. There were three questions on there. Want to know why you joined Naval Order? Want to know why you uh, are inspired to renew your membership on an annual basis? And let us know what we can do with Continental Commandery to engage you more actively. Good night, all.